Thank you, Ignacio. Thank you, Frank, for organizing this, this event. And, and so I'm accepting the challenge, and I'll get a talk on, on the board. Um, <coughs> I think this it's not a bad idea. Well, uh, allow me to ex explain a number of things. And maybe if, maybe if, if a smaller number, hopefully a little bit better explained. Um, let's see. So um, I'll really talk about symmetry protected phases. So um, let me put that there. Invariance of symmetry protected gap ground state phases. Um, and uh, I'll explain uh, in what context. And so basically, I'll, I'll give a little introduction that um, explains what this problem is about and why you may be interested in looking at it. Then I will say a few things that are, that are very general and sort of easy um, and apply to lots of systems. Uh, but we'd like to know more. But the more we can, at the moment, do for a large class of systems, so I'll then focus on a specific case of frustration-free quantum spin chains with uh, matrix product ground states, or finitely correlated states, as uh, they are also known. And that will be a little bit more specific and will involve a little bit of computation. Um, I will see how far we get. So, <coughs> so first, so, so what, a, what is an invariant? What, what, what kind of invariance would I like to study? Um, <coughs> so in this audience, probably uh, everybody knows what uh, a quantum spin Hamiltonian is and uh, what the spectral gap refers to and um, what the problem is of, of classifying uh, <coughs> gap ground state phases and what quantum phase transitions may be. But let me just make this a little bit more uh, specific. Um, <coughs> so uh, a quantum spin system, the quantum spin uh, system defined on a lattice, and I will often talk about an infinite lattice and, and then finite subsets. And it's not important here, um, so I will, what this lattice exactly is. Um, for instance, maybe the new dimensional, dimensional hypercubic lattice, it could be some, it actually doesn't have to be a lattice. Um, some metric graph with some decent properties would also do. But I don't um, necessarily, when I talk about a model on Z or on Z, Z nu, I sometimes want to define it on a half infinite chain. Um, so this is not the only infinite set. Uh, that will play an important role. So something like this, we will also need to consider. And then you start by defining this model on finite volume. So if I write lambda, it's always finite, a finite subset of gamma. And for such uh, subsets, I can define the Hamiltonian. And uh, so you can have all kinds of terms, but in general, uh, I'm, it's not worth in a talk like this to spelling out the most general conditions under which something can be proved. It would take a lot of time. Uh, so say finite range, so maybe it's nearest neighbor, maybe it has some other terms. And we will be interested in the case that this Hamiltonian depends on a parameter. So these interaction terms depend on a parameter. Uh, and uh, S, say, is in an interval 0, 1, right? a real number. So that's the, the Hamiltonian of, uh, of the system, and, uh, and it acts on, it's, so it's a Hermitian matrix acting on the Hilbert space, which I'm going to assume is simply a, a tensor product of um, identical Hilbert spaces. Also, that is not essential. So we see all of these, oh, this one is far away. <coughs> They're all C, CD, say, finite dimensional Hilbert space. So 
so the gap property, um, I, I, I will assume throughout, is that the spectrum of H lambda, this emission matrix, is a subset of, of uh, the union of two sets, so there is an interval, um, which I will denote suggestively E0 lambda of S. This is a sm typically the smallest eigenvalue. And then there is a delta lambda. So this is a short interval near the bottom of the spectrum that contains the ground state, and maybe some states slightly above it. The idea is that I may want to include states that, as the system increases, also converge to ground states. You cannot exclude that. And then there is um, something of the form E0s lambda plus gamma plus infinity. So the delta lambdas and the, and the gammas are positive numbers. The delta lambda go to 0 as I go to my infinite lattice, if that's the situation I'm considering. But the gamma is a positive constant. And so there is always, for sufficiently large finite lambda, a gap between this little interval at the bottom and the rest of the spectrum is separated finite distance. So that is, uh, and that's uh, uniform in S. I mean, the, the location of the ground state may definitely depend on S, but that gap doesn't depend on S, or at least there is a lower bound for it that doesn't depend on S. So that I'm going to call a gap path. All of this, or a gap path of Hamiltonians. That S is sort of the path parameter. So that's the situation I want to talk about. Excuse me, why do yeah? we need this delta to go to zero and then uh, Well, I mean, there's certain things I can do, but if I want to, I'm going to be talking about ground state phases all the time. So if delta lambda doesn't go to zero, I may get in the limit states that are in ground states. It depends. There, there, you could, there are situations where um, it may be useful, actually, to consider a delta that is of order one. If you have a specific model where you know somehow that there are excitations at the boundary that uh, in, in, in size don't go to zero, but they eventually uh, that do not take you away from the ground states, you could consider it. But sort of, to be sure we're talking about ground states, I'm going to assume that this delta lambda vanishes in the thermodynamic limit. So, um, you don't require it to go to zero exponentially fast or with some particular speed. No, no. It could just be how Yes. And that covers a lot of cases. Um, now, <coughs> so, I'm going to be interested in, in the set of all, uh, I, call, I will call them ground states. I, I don't want to <coughs> consider the situation where, where in, and certainly for finite lamp volume, this set may include some excitations, but let's just assume lambda is big enough and I'm, and I'm talking about ground states. So I'm, I'm going to take the, the node by S, the set S that depends on both lambda and S as the set of all states that I can make, density matrices that I can make supported by eigenvectors with eigenvalues in that bottom interval. So this is a bit long to write, but um, so I'm call, I call that finite volume set of all ground states. So the uh, all the density matrices that um, are supported by eigenvectors with energies in here, with eigenvalues in here, I'm going to call that set. And then I'm going to be interested in the weak limits of that set as lambda goes to gamma. So then I'm going to have another notation. So if when, when lambda goes to gamma, uh, these converge to another set. And they are, in general, the uh, gamma will be infinite, and this is uh, the set of all weak limits of states omega lambda in S lambda S. So weak limits means you take the expectation for some fixed local observable, uh, and uh, uh, you take states for which these expectations all converge. 
take a sequence of states for which these expectations all converge. Such things always <laughs> exist. And uh, I denote that set by as gamma. Is that a, I don't need to explain it any further, I think. Right? Weak limits, just uh, expectation values converge. Excuse so. Me. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, yeah. You worry about the size of a system. You have to select uh, a sequence of a size to take a sum of Right, right. And uh, so, sure. But any, any sequence that is increasing and eventually absorbs any finite subset of gamma will do. And taking different sequences may give you different limits. And all these limits are included in the set. I see. OK? Um, so you can take different sequences of lambdas. And for each lambda, you may pick a state in here. And the only requirement is that it converges to something well-defined as a function on the algebra of observables. And these are all my ground states for the infinite system. So now, um, so what's a, an, an, an invariant? Um, so the, uh, basically an invariant is a quantity that I can associate with these states that will be constant along the curves, uh, that will be independent of this parameter if I have a gap path. And, and the idea is that um, uh, as long as I have the open gap, I'm in the same gap ground state phase. But it's interesting that the, a system, depending on a parameter, doesn't have, a, you know, maybe if, the, if I extend the range of the parameter or for other, other models, the gap may actually vanish. Uh, this uniform lower bound may, may vanish somewhere for a value of s, and that's where I see quantum phase transitions. And so the role of invariance is to help you detect quantum phase transitions. It's a necessary condition for a quantum phase transition to occur that the gap vanishes. In principle, it's possible the gap vanishes, you don't really have a transition. If the gap vanishes, how do you know this is a size state with this de degenerated ground state? Um, well, uh, I'm going to, so there is, a, there is a, uh, a question of whether you can reverse implications but this is the definition I, I will use. So if I have this, um, in the situation I'm talking about, like frustration-free models, this immediately implies there's a gap for the GNS Hamiltonian in the, for the infinite system. It's a nice salvage on the operator with a spectrum that has a gap. And the ground state may be degenerate. Um, that's, a different, that's a different issue. Uh, that doesn't mean there, is, there isn't a gap. Sometimes I, we find, indeed, the degeneracy of the ground state. And there's different kinds of degeneracies. And that degeneracy will often depend on the choice of the infinite lattice. I take, I take an infinite chain, infinite in both directions, it will be different in general than if I take a chain that goes to infinity in only one direction. But that's an important, that's an important thing to use, in fact. Yes? Is there a sufficiency condition for one phase transition? Uh, well, uh, for, all, for types of phase transitions for which you have something like an order param parameter, then the, the, it's easy to satisfy, you know, if there's, there are many sufficient conditions, but whether is there one global sufficient condition, I don't know, if you're symmetry breaking versus no symmetry breaking, well, that's, uh, that's a sufficient condition. Um, so, okay. So these invariants, they, they can change in value only at quantum phase transitions. And uh, so, and, and the point is, and this, this can be interesting because if you uh, if you study studying the gap is not necessarily an easy problem. Um, so you may study gamma, the real gap, or a bound for it. You can do it numerically. Maybe maybe there is a, a critical point here. But if you do numerical calculations, you may see something like this. You can compute some values. You can compute some values here. It looks like it's going to vanish somewhere. Uh, but how do you know it really vanishes? Actually, the, pr the problem of computing it becomes usually more complicated as the gap becomes small. And so you may want to have another tool to tell you that, in fact, it does vanish. And an invariant would do that. Because if you can compute an invariant <coughs> here and an invariant there, and it has a different value, then by the fact that it's an invariant, 
it will imply that the gap vanishes at least at one point in, the, in between. So that's, that's the idea of invariance. Okay. So, and you can ask the question whether you can find enough invariance to actually uh, obtain equivalent conditions. And uh, there's some ongoing work about, about this. Uh, Bachmann and, and Ogata have some results on that. I won't talk about that. Uh, I think Yoshiko Ogata may be in the audience. I think she was going to be here. So maybe you can ask her. Um, but I will only uh, talk about one implication. So if, uh, if, the if there is an invariant that takes different values, then you have a quantum phase transition. Okay, I'm only going to talk about this, this implication. And that is uh, what I'm going to say next is mostly based on uh, joint work with Sven Bachmann, who is now in Munich at the LMU. And it's in a, in a, in a, in a paper in Journal of Statistical Physics, 2014. It's the Herbert Schoen special issue. But you can find it on the archive everywhere, of course. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Well, there's lots of things. It could certainly be uh, interpreted as a level crossings in, in some ways. But there's lots of things that we don't know about in general quantum phase transitions. There are some that are understood because they can be related to, to models we, we can either we can solve exactly or they can be, be modeled by something we know, we know much better. In general, we, we don't know very much. Okay. Um, I think we don't know in general, for instance, that the gap is a continuous function of such a parameter. I'm going to assume I didn't say that these are always differentiable functions of the parameter. The way I treat it. I have to say something, obviously, otherwise it doesn't make any sense what I'm saying. But uh, continuous is probably enough, but uh, in some of the proofs we use derivatives. Okay. So, so what about the, uh, the, the general stuff? Some uh, You can say general properties of gap paths and the associated ground states. So this is sort of the, the soft stuff, but it's, it's sort of important to start with that. Um, and that is, uh, is basically the, the notion of automorphic equivalence. That's what we call it. Maybe it's not a very beautiful name, but. Um, uh, sorry? Yes? Uh, I didn't yet understood uh, what's exactly the invariant is. Uh, well, I, uh, I want to find them. But it's, it should be an object, a mathematical object, such as a dimension, say, that I can calculate based on the information about the ground state, number one. And it should be con constant along gap paths of Hamilton. If I look at the ground states uh, along one of these gap paths, it should be constant. So. If it's a dimension and integer, that integer should be constant. Right? And then the way to use it is if you, if you compute it in two points and you find a different constant, then you know something happens in between. Right? You have crossed the phase transition. And the gap closed somewhere in between. But I haven't told you what they are, so I'm, I'm going to get there. Um, OK. So, so this is, a, a, and I'm going to now immediately assume that I have a continuous symmetry. In fact, for the first part, I don't need to assume that the symmetry is continuous. Let, so let's suppose that we have um, uh, a gap path with a local symmetry, G. And uh, it's, it's OK to always think about just spin SU2 invariance of, of a spin model, or something like that, if that's what you're familiar with. Some of these things are more general. Um, so when it's a local symmetry, so it means it acts on each of the individual Hilbert spaces. I'm going to say by some fixed representation. So, so, there, are, uh, so there are 
unitaries UG that uh, represent the symmetry. <coughs> These are D by D unitary matrices, and they act on the um, CD on the space of a single spin. And then by tensor product, it acts on the whole system. And the symmetry means that all these terms, so if I take the tensor product of these unitaries, all x and x, then that commutes with the, all the terms that <coughs> enter in the Hamiltonian. And that's a local symmetry. So for instance, um, uh, I don't know, if, if you know the AKLT model, it's a good example to think about in basically everything what I'm going to say. So maybe, maybe I'll briefly put it here. <coughs> The AKLT chain. So D is equal to 3. It's a spin 1 chain. And its nearest neighbor, so it's in one dimension. So D, it would be defined for, for a lambda of the form, say, 1 L in finite volume. And then it's a nearest neighbor interaction. One way to write it is as the spin 2 projection uh, on the tensor product of two spins. So there is a five-dimensional space of states that is given energy 1, and then uh, the rest have energy 0. The kernel of, of this is four-dimensional for every finite volume. And so there are, uh, we are in a, in a simple situation where you can take this to be one point, if you want, 0. There will be a four-dimensional eigenspace of the eigenvalue zero, and then you have this situation where you have a gap and the rest of the spectrum is separated. Uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> it's one, it, this could be one point in some of these curves. And the symmetry uh, is, is SU2. In this case, and it's implemented by the spin one representation three-dimensional irreducible representation of SU2. Okay? So, so then, um, when you have all this, uh, then um, the, uh, there exist um, unitaries, uh, which I will denote by V lambda S, um, and they are sometimes called the uh, quasi adiabatic evolution of sometimes spectral flow uh, based on ideas of Hastings. So Hastings tells us it is going to be unitaries that, that map uh, uh, the ground state space of the different uh, values. Hamiltonian different values of the parameter into each other. So if I take vectors, psi lambda s, I will always be able to write them as some unit, fixed unitary transformation, I to psi lambda zero. And these uh, unitaries are quasi-local. I mean, that's the essential point. Because otherwise, there's no information in the fact that there exist unitaries. Um, since I have, uh, these are all matrices as long as the volume is finite. And if, if the spectrum is separated like that, then the dimension of this piece cannot change. That's clear and therefore can always be transformed by a unitary from one value to another. That's not, that's, not, that's not special at all. But what's special is that these unitaries can be constructed sort of in a consistent way for all sizes and they have a quasi-local structure. And that, so one way to say exactly what that is, um, I'm not going to go into detail, is um, that uh, they satisfy some kind of Lee Robinson bound, if you know that, or I can also say something else. You can think of them as, as the solution of some dynamics for a finite range interaction. Um, and that is, or, or, a, or short range interaction. And this quasi-locality property will guarantee that you can take the thermodynamic limit of the action of these unitaries 
on the algebra of observers. Yes, Vladimir? For KLT, your parameter S, what is it? What's S for KLT? I said this would be one point in some curve, right? There's no parameter in it. There's no parameter. Um, so, so, you know, if yes. you start from the whole point and satisfy the Lee-Robertson bond, does the quasi-local one also satisfy the Lee-Robertson In general, I cannot prove it like that. But um, if you start from uh, local Hamiltonians that satisfy some exponential bound on the range of the interactions, I can get quasi-locals that satisfy a bound that is almost exponential. Uh, but in terms of just from the problems and the problems and that I cannot do. And I don't know whether that's, that would be true. <coughs> but for all practical purposes, um, you have enough locality for most models you want to consider. Another question? Sorry. Yes? What's the role of the symmetry in the existence of the unitaries? There is no. In the existence of unitaries, the symmetry plays no role, but it, it comes in a second. So um, I'm going to focus on, the, on that case, and you, you'll see immediately where, where it comes in. But let me first um, take the thermodynamic limit of the action of these unitaries. Um, so, so the way that goes is, I define, I think I can still write it. Does that show up? No. Uh, so uh, alpha s of a is equal to the limit lambda going to gamma of V lambda S star A V lambda S for all local observables A. Local observables something that involves only a finite number of spins. Okay? This will exist and it will be nice uh, automorphism that will satisfy Lee problems and bounds and for some other technical stuff this is needed but I'm not, I'm not going to need it here um, and this uh, so this automorphism will also map the uh, ground states into the ground states but I can now do this for these weak limits and if I have the symmetry G it will commute with the symmetry G um, so I can Take rotate the state and transform it. I will get the same result if I just transform it and then rotate. So let me let me write this formally. Maybe I should write it here. Huh? So um, the ground states at parameter s can be obtained by compose with the automorphism all the states with parameter zero. So this is some sort of local transformation on the observables. Um, and so the ground states of one model uh, are, are really only locally different, if you want, uh, from the ground states at parameter s under these conditions. And the, the alphas commute, so that means the following. So if I take this uh, alpha s of an observable um, that I have conjugated with the unitary. All right, so there is a, a, a corresponding symmetry transformation. Let's call it tau g of a would be u star g many, as many times as you need u g. And well, commuting means uh, what you think it means. You know, you get the same result like this. And this, uh, now combined with the um, fact that the alphas map into the states, give you the fact, the immediate fact, that the um, action of the symmetry on the states at parameter value equal to zero and parameter value equal to s are equivalent. By this alpha is a linear map. It's an invertible linear map. And so these representations are equivalent. So the, the action of the symmetry G on, on this state is equivalent, is by an equivalent representation to the one. I'm uh, 
not writing a lot of formulas and specific things because the different ways you can look at this, you can look at the pure states or you can look at the con all the convex hull of all the states and you get different representations. But if you do the same thing for the different values of the parameter, then you get equivalent representations. So and in the example, um, so to, to use the example, um, we need to choose a gamma. If I take gamma to be the infinite chain, then there's really not much interesting to say because this model happens to have thermodynamic limiting ground states that are just exactly one pure state. So as gamma for the AKLT model, but gamma is equal to the infinite chain at just one point. And there's not much symmetry to do. I mean, of course, it's invariant under the symmetry, but there's nothing much going on. But if you take gamma to be the half infinite chain, you take it one plus infinity, <coughs> then um, you get a two-dimensional space of thermodynamic limits. Then, as gamma for the AKLT model, so this is the AKLT chain. Um, I can write it like this, maybe. Huh? Is the state space of of C two of a spin one half? So this whole state, if you take all the the convex hull, it's it just a block sphere of all the states of a spin one half value. Uh, and so, sorry. So for the finite chain in this model, of course, you have four ground states. That's right. Um, so you're saying somehow it reduces to two when you take the limits. How, how right. does one understand that in terms of weak limits or something? How does that happen? Right. So, so um, when you take the right boundary to infinity, um, at, at finite distance there is a spin one half type structure sitting there, but um, its influence to the place where you put your observable decays exponentially fast to the distance and you take the limit and there is no effect of the right boundary condition. The left boundary condition on the other hand stays at finite distance <coughs> and still makes a difference and you get a, a two-dimensional state, space of ground states. It's not clear to me how the dimension of the space of states changes. If I think of them as pure states, I'm really talking about... It does, it, it's not a continuous thing, that's right. The dimension of the, of, if you want, the, the pure states is not continuous on the weak limits. Um, that's, that's correct. And certainly the convergence couldn't be a norm on any one of the stronger mm -hmm. ways that states could, could converge. It's only we converge. So is it, in, sorry to keep going on about this, but is it important that you work with density matrices to take the limit and then you extract pure states from density um, matrices afterwards? In some cases it is indeed important because um, uh, because that's the other thing, the, the limit of pure states doesn't have to be a pure state. So you can get limits in the weak limiting process that are non-pure states in some cases. So yeah, there's example, certainly examples of that. Um, so in this sense, it, it is important. Okay. So, so for the AKLT model, I would have then um, this action of the symmetry and for the AKLT model in the, in the, on the half infinite chain would ben, then be, if you look at the pure states, it would be a spin one half representation. If you look at the density matrices, it would be the, the adjoint representation of that, which would be, would have a singlet and a, and a triplet in it. Okay? And if I now were to embed the AKLT chain in a gap path of Hamiltonians, that property would have to be preserved. And we believe, for instance, that the standard spin one antiferromagnetic Heisenberg chain is in the same phase and has the same property. So what I'm saying is that if you look at the ground states of that model on a half infinite chain, you will find uh, basically a two-dimensional space of pure states. If you want, you can find a spin one half, a state space of a spin one half with the action of the spin one half representation on it. So, yes. So what do you call the invariant then? What is that? What, what, what do you call the invariant? It's coming. Ah. <laughs> You say Heisenberg, Heisenberg spin one, right? Right, spin one, yes, absolutely. So, okay, but there is already an invariant here if, if you want. So if you have uh, in this abstract setting, which is the, the, the nature of this representation. But, there is, uh, but for instance, to find it in the AKLT chain, I had to go to a half infinite chain. And, and that is one, from the one hand natural, from the other hand, not so satisfying. 
Um, it would be better if I could calculate something in the bulk doing observables um, uh, so you can accumulate statistics, take some local observable and, and, and measure it or compute it in the bulk and, and detect invariant. That would be more useful. So that's what sort of the rest of the talk will be about. But if, if you wish, there is an invariant here. That is the nature of the representation, the action of the symmetry group on the model defined on the half infinite chain. Which, in fact, you can generalize to any gamma. You, you can take half planes or you can take uh, lattices on a, on a surface with non-trivial topology. And um, in general, th so there will be an action of the symmetry if the symmetry is not broken. And the action will be by a representation that doesn't change up to equivalence as you vary the parameter s. So um, that's if you want the invariant. But now I want to sort of go a step further and show that in some cases this invariant can be detected in the bulk. That is, uh, I can take a ground state of the thermodynamic limit of the AKLT chain, for instance, um, on the bi-infinite chain and do a calculation on point and invariant. So that answer the question? Huh? Now I see in your eyes you don't believe me. But <laughs> 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 okay. So so let me see. Let me erase now. Well, I can add a little bit. So I have to. Um, I'm going to use the finitely finitely correlated state formalism. So I probably need to put a few things on the board about that uh, to explain uh, what I'm going to do. Do we have a all right, so we're doing okay. So, so there are two situations where, uh, where I can show that um, the nature of this representation um, is detectable in the bulk, and that's for spin chains. Either at are frustration free, I have uh, matrix product ground states. Another class is, uh, uh, about which I, I won't say anything, but it's a similarly interesting class of models that is disjoint from the MPS class, which is one for which you can, uh, in space-time, have a random loop representation with positive measures. And, um, and that's sort of interesting because some spin one half models fall in this case, and uh, the positive measure is important, so you can use <coughs> probabilistic arguments, which I'm not going to do here. Um, and essentially, it's a class that where the same result holds, although it's sort of disjoint of, of the MPS class. Um, so, and you can continue to think about SU2, but um, uh, I, did, I really want to uh, talk about, um, you, you can take G just a, a, a connected, compact V group. It's, it's continuous symmetry. Um, but say, think as you do, and uh, I'm going to have um, frustration-free uh, spin chains, so in one dimension, with MPS ground states. And I'm going to quickly sort of review some aspects um, that we will uh, have, that we will use. The finitely correlated the finitely correlated state formalism, I think, works really well for the kind of things we want to do here. So let me uh, recall a few things. Um, so we have these uh, these symmetries U G, the d a d dimensional representation of our symmetry. And say we have um, uh, a nearest neighbor interaction, but it doesn't really matter. It's nearest neighbor. Um, and let's focus, let's focus on the situation where we have a unique ground state and a thermodynamic limit. And then you can sort of think what happens if you have multiple ground states, some symmetry, discrete symmetries maybe there are broken, things like that. But you can sort of work it out starting from, from the basic result. Um, so we have, this is uh, UG symmetric. Um, unique ground state 
which of course will automatically be a pure state in that case uh, of, uh, of the MPS form. And I will tell you exactly uh, what that means. So, so what, I, what I mean, so these are things I worked out a long time ago with Mark Fanas and Reinhard Werner. There will be an isometry V that um, intertwines this uh, representation with another representation. Um, or maybe I should start by saying that there is another representation. And I call it little, little UG. And um, you can as well think about it as you too. And then isometry. Um, V. And this one, um, the dimension, let's do it like this. Say the R and K. K dimensional. And an isometry that embeds uh, CK and CD tensor CK, um, intertwining the representation. So UG, VUG is. should switch to a different pen. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. OK. Let's see. This one I already tried, it's not very good. Um, let's see. UG so in the AKLT case uh, capital UG was a spin 1 representation 3 dimensional, little UG is a spin 1 half representation 2 dimensional and so the V embeds this uh, spin 1 half representation in the tensor product which decomposes in a spin 1 half representation and a spin uh, 1 plus a half, 3 half representation so this, is, this V in this case if the representations are are a reducible representation of SU2, for instance, will be unique, but in general it could be non-unique. That's not important here. But it does it has this intertwining property. So this is uh, this is D, this is K, this is K. Okay, so it's a DK times K matrix. So for the MPS aficionados, um, this V, if you write it as a matrix, is the column of matrices that define your matrix product state. These are k by k matrices, and you put them in a column. That's the that's the v. But but since the symmetry problem is important here, it's sort of more convenient to actually work with it, with the v. So then, um, so I'm going to describe now how the state, this pure state, is defined in terms of these objects. And uh, so for that, it's uh, convenient to introduce the following maps. So for every A in MD, that is a one spin observable, we define the map E sub A of B, which is V star A tensor B, V, for all B in MK. <coughs> so, you can count the dimensions, it works. This, this is a, a, a nice map uh, from NK to NK that depends on a d-dimensional matrix, also linearly. You can also think of it as a map of MD tensor MK to MK. And um, so let me, uh, so the relation to the state is, so the, um, so the uh, this pure state, this unique ground state, that we are talking about here. Um, on a simple tensor of observables, so if you take, take AI in MD, take N of them, tensor product, so that <coughs> um, expectation well, the essential part of it is composition of the maps EA. This is composition of maps then acting on the identity. Taking the trace with a density matrix row, 
and that gives you the unique pure state. Um, so I'm going to use these kind of things, and there's, let's see, maybe I'll leave the EKL teaching up there for just another minute. So now, um, so what we know in this situation is that uh, E sub 1, which in uh, the MPS language is called the double tensor, um, has a, a, under these conditions a spectrum that, that, that looks, it's complex numbers, it's contained in the unit circle, one is an eigenvalue, but that's the only eigenvalue on the unit circle. All the other eigenvalues are here. Um, maybe there is an eigenvalue here, maybe, maybe not. So, but there is a sort of a gap in the spectrum. There's this lambda in zero one, uh, and um, and and one is simple as an eigenvalue. And of course, the eigenvector is the identity because this is v star v, and v was an isometry. And so the identity is always an eigenvector of this map. But the important thing is that um, uh, we have this trivial peripheral spectrum. So there's just a simple eigenvalue 1 there. And, and that implies that if you iterate the map, it will uh, converge exponentially fast to a rank one operator. So if I iterate this map, um, I will go to right eigenvector, left eigenvector, exponentially fast. And the left eigenvector uh, is a, uh, can be taken to be a density matrix. follows on the general theory is a completely positive map. So it has a positive eigenvector. And um, anyway, so it's also a simple eigenvalue. Okay. And um, so, um, so what, that, what, what that means is that trace row E1B is trace row B for all B in MK. And if you, are, uh, you have the, the situation here with the symmetry, um, you, will, you will have that row, row is symmetric, uh, it will commute uh, with the um, <coughs> with little ug for all g because of its uniqueness. This is easy to check. So but the important thing is from the purity of the, of the state, it follows that you have the simple eigenvalue and have this exponential convergence. Um, okay. So I'm just uh, putting a few things on the board that will explain why we can calculate this invariant in, in the bulk. So the invariant we're talking about is the <coughs> action of the symmetry, the nature of the representation of the symmetry on the ground states of a half-infinite chain. But I have to somehow see this in an infinite chain. So, uh, so we, will, we will need this map, and we will also need the maps EUG, which uh, you think about it for a second and play around with these relations, is actually similar to E1, has the same spectrum. Um, and uh, <coughs> it has also a trivial peripheral spectrum. And But now, so this is the eigenvector is little UG and the eigenvector of the transpose. So there's a similar relation if you want is rho u g star. It's only a few lines to check all of that, but in the interest of time, maybe I should move on. These are, these are simple relations that follow from the intertwining relation of v. Um, but since it also has stable peripheral spectrum, uh, I will also have that uh, if I iterate this map, it will converge to another rank one operator. So this is now capital UG. 
generated. So that will uh, converge to uh, right eigenvector, left eigenvector. Exponentially fast. Okay, so so why are these properties important? Um, well, because of what I'm going to do next. Which is really a calculation in, in the GNS representation of the state. But um, the essential part is just a convergence of expectation values. So I'm going to try to explain it like that. Um, but I'll tell you what it, what it sort of implies. <coughs> so um, basically what I'm <coughs> claiming is that we can give a, a good definition of the action of the symmetry, but acting only on half the chain, but not a half chain, half of an infinite chain. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to have the infinite chain, and I want to act with an infinite tensor products of unitaries, starting here. So U G tensor U G tensor U G, and this is uh, well, that's not obvious that something like this is well defined. Um, it has to do with the fact that the symmetry isn't broken, but also with the fluctuations in, in, in this in the state. Um, if if you have an invariant state, one that is invariant, if I do tensor product infinite in both directions, then there is a general theorem that says that such a unitary representation of the symmetry exists on the, uh, the GNS space of the infinite state. But I don't, the state is not symmetric, is not invariant under the action of these unitaries, so a priori, I don't, I don't know that. And, and in, in a way, the existence of this, I'm going to call, so I want to call this, I haven't yet proved that it exists, u plus g, is uh, if it's going to be a nice, strongly continuous representation, nice unitaries, it's really equivalent to uh, the existence of an infinite sum of the generators. So these are, say, spin matrices on X. And I want to sum an infinite number of spin matrices from X to plus infinity, right? Where UG is of the form E to the IG S, say, and, and S is the traceless remission matrix. Say, a spin, a spin matrix. So, so normally, uh, if you have an infinite sum like this, uh, even if there's no non no order, you may be worried that, that this doesn't fluctuate too much, and this may not exist. But um, we will prove that it exists, and in this case, I will actually work with the unitaries. And the way to do it is by uh, introducing a, a cutoff function that looks like this, FL. Um, so, so you can think of G as a, a, a sort of identified group element, and there's real parameters. Um, so you can think of it the angle. Um, so I'm going to uh, make a tensor product that, that on the left here rotates over G but then gradually fades away and becomes the identity. So, so this cutoff function is something like this form. So it's going to be 1 for L sides and then it's going to be 1 minus 1 over L, minus 2 over L, etc. And then eventually it will go to 0 and L squared. Okay? And, and you will immediately understand why this choice has to do with the, the fact that I want to use these properties. So then I can define uh, S plus L is sort of a, a weighted sum. Um, no, well, I can write plus infinity, but I'm going to put F there, so it really only goes to L squared. FL, I think it's convenient to put this. And then U plus L of G um, is just uh, E to the I G S plus L. So this is uh, starting with no rotation, then rotation of very small angle, then I gradually increase the angle. Um, so the claim is that you can compute First, a weak limit, and then some technical stuff lets to, you conclude that 
there's actually strong limits uh, of this to the object that I want. And so, so I'm going to formulate that as a theorem and um, sort of avoid the language of, of the GNS space. So take some finite fixed M, uh, you take observables in the algebra, so observables of minus N, N. All right, so that's isomorphic to MD to the 2N plus 1. And I'm going to look at uh, uh, the expectation of, I'll write it like, like so, it will be meaningful for some people. So I'm going to switch this operator between two arbitrary observables that's equivalent to taking matrix elements with vectors in the GNS Hilbert space. And then I can take the limit, and I'm claiming it converges, and converges something really beautiful. I have a formula for the limit. It is this map E iterated. I will explain what that is. And then I have a bunch of ones. Um, then I have a bunch of U's. Then I have A2, and I apply this to little ug. And it's all about the little ug. So let me try to. A capital is a vector here, right? So capital A's are observables for the spin chain. So multi spin observables. But with a fixed number of spins, they are localized in the interval minus n. So if I have something like this, an iteration, so this is the sort of linear extension of the iteration of maps, A1, say, AM. So if A is tensor product of m factors. I can iterate these maps, but then I, I can actually also linearly extend that because all these maps depend linearly on A, and that's this notation. So, so this is a, an observable that the way it's written there is not a tensor product, so I can't really decompose it, but I'm doing what I would have to do to compute its expectation value, giving the, the final way it states formula for correlation functions. But the difference is that if I put in the middle there the u plus g instead of the formula here with the 1 on the right hand side, I get little ug. I get this representation of the symmetry as the right boundary condition. So that's, that's the, what's important about this formula. And the rest is just an annotation of, of it's, it's really the same formula, but I have put little ug there on the right. Um, so that's how the, these rotations then act on the right infinite chain. So and, and it follows from, from general nonsense that this is going to be a nice representation of the group and, uh, and it has all the properties you want. Okay, so now it's time to sort of see what it means. Um, so let's take um, observables A1 and A2 that are located here. So um, I should make that a little bit more clear, perhaps. So I have my unitaries there, then I have A1 and A2 here, right? So they act on the left. And I'm going to uh, think of the space of, of states that I get. So, so first, I think the UG is not there. So I have this uh, state of the bi-infinite chain. And I act with arbitrary observables on the left side. You can think of this as boundary conditions or conditionings or whatever on the left. And what you're going to get, because of the frustration free property is obvious, is ground states of the Hamiltonian on the right. Because there, I haven't put any observables. The Hamiltonian would still act at 0. And so, um, so I'm going to call this, uh, I'm going to think of this as the action 
of u plus g on ground states on the right half of the chain, but they are not a half chain. It's just all the vectors that I get by perturbing the original unique ground state by operators on the left. That's a nice space on which the symmetry acts. And, um, and, it, and uh, it's, an, it's invariant under this. Uh, so you can, you, can, you can prove that because this acts on the, on the, uh, on the Hilbert space. It, it amounts to proving that this is in the, well, it doesn't matter, in the commutant of the, of the phenomenon algebra of the left observables of the state. And that is now a representation of G that is very similar to what I had before, namely the action of the symmetry on the ground states of a half chain. And guess what? Let's see what it is. Um, so if we apply this, these, this formula here, then what we get is the following. So the, uh, if I take matrix elements <coughs> with vectors in this space, so that means that I have now something of the form. So now the A1s and A2, I can, I can commute them because they're all on the left. So they, they are this. And if I take the limit, I'm going to get trace rho some iteration of the maps simply applied to little vg. That's, that's what this will say. Because well, if you want, you can, you can take this formula, you put the A2 here, then you, you have a number of times E of UG, UG, but that just reproduces UG as long as I have capital UG here. Little UG is just an eigenvector, and the formula you get is this. And now, this tells me um, that this representation must be contained in the direct sum of little UGs, and since these are infinite dimensional spaces, it must be an infinite number of copies, but there is no other. So all the matrix elements, this, all, this is just a linear map. This is a linear combination of matrix elements of little UG, nothing else. And little UG was that original representation that I used to construct the state, right? And little UG is also the representation that you find if you start with a half infinite chain, which I argued was invariant. So I can calculate the matrix elements of this representation in this way as limits of observables of local, um, local, uh, local things. So it's observable in the, in the chain. And a, a representation is a, a fully determined by its matrix elements by some old theorem of, of while. If the matrix elements look like matrix elements of little ug, then little ug is what it is. You don't know the multiplicity. Uh, if it's an irreducible representation, this has to be an identity. There's no other way. If it's a reducible representation, it's not, the, the multiplicities may change and so on. But, um, also, um, in, 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 in the case that I described here, like for the AKLT model, in fact, you get all uh, matrix elements. So even if it's an irreducible representation, you will get all matrix elements, and you will all also have identity. So in general, you will have identity. Um, and this shows that. <coughs> um, little g is is observable in the bulk um, and the great invariant okay I'm running out of time I believe and but I'm essentially at the end of my story um, Maybe just a, a, a few comments. Um, so as I said, there is another class of one-dimensional models for which I can prove the same result in a different way. Um, but of course, we are all, many of us, I know, are really interested in two-dimensional models. And, and there, um, well, the general soft theory applies. So if you have systems with a boundary, um, you, you will be able to use the representation of the symmetry on the boundary as an invariant, but I don't know how practical it will be. I don't know how to extract it from the bulk. And in fact, uh, often, um, there, it will often have, is my sense, sort of an essential part and then other parts. And then 
to distinguish one from the other, I don't know exactly how to do. And then on top of everything, um, uh, not only is it difficult to prove that you have a bound, a uniform, low bound spectral gap in higher dimensions, there are actually maybe cases where you, where you don't because you have boundary excitations that are gapless. And sort of the same idea should apply, but you will be, have to invent something to overcome the, the existence of gapless excitations that sort of close a gap that really there is somewhere a gap you could use, but it's sort of not a gap in the spectrum and therefore a little bit more difficult to handle. But I'm running over time, so I'll stop. Thank you. So if you, if you know, we have several uh, breaks, basically after every talk or every second talk. So since we are a little bit over time, so I will invite everybody to ask the questions when we do the coffee break and to do it also during the, the next day. So we use the coffee breaks to ask questions to a speaker if they are all the time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah.